In today's video, we're going to talk about five C-sharp naming conventions that I always follow if I can. Naming, even though it's not significant from the compiler's point of view, when we're looking at a code base, then naming can go a long way in making your code more readable, more maintainable, especially if you're working in a team environment, then good naming can really go a long way. Now, of course, naming is very opinionated. We're talking specifically about things that I choose to do in my code bases. You don't have to do this. This is just what I do and what I would recommend doing if it is up to you. If your project is already following a coding convention that contradicts one of the conventions that I show here, then of course, follow what the code base is working with because consistency is more important and that's the entire point of a coding convention. My name is Amichai and in this channel I talk about software architecture, design patterns, best practices, best naming conventions, various other topics that you really want to be familiar with if you're a software engineer. So if that sounds interesting, then make sure to smash the subscribe button so you don't miss out on future videos. So what I have over here is a very basic web API where we have a single endpoint called get movie. So you can go ahead and specify a movie ID and then using the movie service, then we go ahead and we fetch the movie and return it back to the client. If you noticed over here, we have an if check where there are two specific bad numbers where if you specify them, then you receive bad request. Okay, so let's look at the very first naming convention, which is how to name Boolean methods. So over here, we have this if check. Let's extract this to a method. Now, of course, you can go ahead and name this in 100 different names and they'll all be valid names. But what I wanna focus on specifically is the prefix that I use for Boolean methods. So Boolean methods, I make sure to always start them with one of the following, either with is, calling it is something, or has something. Okay, so again, any Boolean method, I go ahead and call it is something or has something. In this example, we can go ahead and call this something like is valid number. And then of course, over here, we need to go ahead and replace this with the opposite. And over here, we can go ahead and say, if it is not a valid number, then we go ahead and we return a problem. Okay, now a very common approach is to call this something like validate or something like that. And I don't like this approach because first of all, it doesn't tell me for free that this is a Boolean method. So I need to go ahead and check exactly what this method returns. And also it's not specific enough for me to understand what is being validated. So over here is valid number. I know that it's a Boolean and I also know what actually happens within this method. Now this tip that I just gave you for methods, it's true also for variables, for fields, for properties, anything that is Boolean, I like to start with is or has. Okay, so pretty simple, Boolean methods, variables, fields, and properties should be prefixed with is or has. And over here we have an example, validate isn't good, but is a valid number is good. Moving on to number two. So the next one also has to do with Booleans. And this isn't a hard convention where this is what you must do, or this is what I always do. But this is more like a strong suggestion and something to be aware of when you're naming your Boolean methods, properties, fields, etc. And that is that you want to use the positive version of the Boolean and not the negative. For example, over here, we called it is valid number. We could have called this is invalid number and then remove this not and replace this with equals. And then we have over here is invalid number. Once your code base consistently uses the positive version, then the cognitive load becomes lower in the long run, trying to understand what a Boolean check does. So over here, we have only one method and this is pretty simple. So if it's is valid or if it is invalid, it doesn't make much of a difference, but many times what you'll have over here is also some field check and also another call to something like has something, something, and sometimes it'll be inverted like we have over here. And once you have all these various Boolean checks or these Boolean equations, it becomes more complicated when sometimes it's positive and sometimes it's negative. That's why I like going always with the positive. So leaving it is valid number. And then when I see a not, then I know that now it's the negative. And when it's not a not, then I know it's a positive. So number two, Boolean methods, variables, fields, and properties should use positive names to avoid double negatives. The example that we gave is, is invalid number is less preferred than is a valid number. Because like we said, if we have many double negatives and we have complex Boolean equations, it becomes harder to understand what's going on. Consistency can be really useful 
in this case. Okay, moving on to number three. Number three is about testing. So we're going to talk about the naming convention that I use for testing. This is true for unit test, integration test, end-to-end -end test, et cetera, et cetera. Any test, this is the naming convention that I go with. After seeing many approaches and seeing large projects, I'm talking about projects with hundreds of people following different naming convention approaches, then this is the single naming convention that I like. Okay, so the convention that I go with is the following. Let's say that over here we have the movie service tests. So I first put the system under test, then I put an underscore, and then I say when X should Y, where the X is the scenario that we're testing and the Y is the expected outcome. Now you may think to yourself, why does it even matter what we name the method that goes ahead and checks other methods. Why does it even matter what we name our tests? Well, in my opinion, it's actually very important because the threshold of writing bad testing code is a much lower than writing bad production code. The name of the test has the potential to reduce dramatically the amount of time that you need from seeing your test fail in your CI CD to figuring out what part of the code is actually causing the problem. Bad test naming can really be frustrating when you're trying to understand what failed or when you're just looking at existing tests and you're trying to understand what the hell they do, the name really can go a long way. So let's imagine that over here, if someone specifies the number 666, then we want to go ahead and throw a new exception like so. So the name that is appropriate for this test is something like the following. We go ahead and say get movie and our X is that when the number is 666. So when we say over here, when ID is 666 should throw exception. So again, what we have over here, the get movie is the system under test. Then we have the when X where the X is the scenario. In our case, it's the ID is 666. And then we have the expected outcome where we have the Y being that the expected outcome is that an exception should be thrown. Now I follow this strictly, meaning that I don't add more underscores when I just need to put another word. I always put it in three different parts. So this will always be T1, T2, and T3. And the reason why I'm strict about this is because like I said, the threshold for writing bad testing code is much lower. And once this becomes a soft rule where you can go ahead and put as many underscores as you want, then this becomes very long and each one creates their own specific style for how they like to name the test method, which defeats the point of having a good consistent naming convention throughout your test project. So again, test methods should be named with the following convention, system under test, and then when scenario should and then the expected behavior. And the example that we looked at is a test in which you wanna make sure that 666 throws an exception. So you don't want any of these examples if you want to follow the convention that I go with, but instead you want to go with the system under test being get movie, and then you have the when and the should. Now, if this entire convention seems ridiculous to you and in your project you don't see any benefit, then don't use this convention. And I hope for you that you'll never work on a project in which you'll understand why the names of the tests can be very important. Okay, moving on to number four and five. These are pretty simple, so we can go over them pretty fast. These both have to do with the naming of private fields that aren't static or constant. So let's say, let's revert back to just using a regular constructor. So if we have over here a private read-only movie service, then the naming convention that I go with is that the movie service, because it's a private field that isn't constant or static, then it starts with an underscore. Now, even though many non-Microsoft projects use this convention within Microsoft, in most of the projects that I worked on, then what was used was simply the naming like so. And then when you need to disambiguate, so for example, over here, we want to disambiguate between the movie service in the class and the movie service that we got over here as an argument. If we want to disambiguate, then we use the this keyword. I don't like this as much as I like the underscore because it's information like with the Boolean methods, it's information that I get for free from looking at the symbol in my code. Okay, now where this becomes interesting is if you use a primary constructor. So over here, we 
or using the primary constructor, if we did something like the following, so we have the primary constructor where we're receiving the movie service, and over here we're assigning it to our private field, which is the movie service. Over here, it's pretty trivial, so we want to have the movie service starting with an underscore, and this one over here is not with an underscore because the movie service isn't captured. So in C Sharp 12, using primary constructors, then the parameters that you specify over here may or may not be captured. They may exist only in the scope of initializing the object, but they also may be captured and used as a private field. This is very easy to demonstrate in Sharplab.io. So over here, I created a class where we have a field that is an integer. And over here, it's actually not a field. So maybe this isn't a good name. Maybe this should be called my parameter. Where over here, we're specifying some parameter, but it's not captured in the class. It'll only be captured if we go ahead and we use it inside the class. So for example, if we have over here some get parameter, and over here we go ahead and we return the my parameter, only then will this my parameter become a field in the class. Now, maybe the naming that I'm using over here isn't good and it's not the best in a video that's all about naming, but let's imagine that we have over here some parameter that we're putting in the primary constructor, it'll only be captured, meaning it'll only become a member of the class if it's used within the methods, which means, going back to our example over here, that what I use for the naming convention is the following. If the parameter over here is captured, then I go ahead and I put the underscore, meaning that if we didn't have the explicit field, and over here we were capturing the movie service, then I would give it an underscore. If we had over here something else that wasn't captured, so let's say we have over here a logger for the movie controller, but we aren't actually capturing it. So over here we have the logger that we're actually using. So over here, by looking at the name of the primary constructor, I know that the movie service is captured, but the logger isn't captured. Okay, so I hope that makes sense and you learned something new. If you do anything differently in your application, then definitely put it in the comments below and let me know what you use. If you have a good explanation for why you do something differently, then maybe you'll convince me and I'll change my opinion. Also, if you like this type of video where I tell you my actual opinion and what I actually use in projects, the conventions that I go with, then make sure to smash the like button so I know that this type of video does well. And if yes, then I'll make more videos because I have many other conventions that I think everyone should be following. And I would love to share <laughs> my thoughts about it with anyone that would be willing to listen. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and you learned something new. Make sure to smash the subscribe button and I'll see you in the next one.